Shalom, call hello la Yahweh ba Hashem which means all praises to Yahweh, which is the true name of the Heavenly Father, who you people in the world ignorantly call God, ba Hashem, in the name of Yahweh Shah, which is the name of the only begotten Son, who you people in the world ignorantly call Jesus Christ. Once again, the true name of the Heavenly Father and the only begotten Son is Yahweh ba Hashem Also, Shalom to you brothers, you Akim, that's pushing and spreading this word throughout the four corners of the earth, who's also uplifting the name Yahweh Wa Yahweh Shah. Shalom to you Akim. No. Shalom also to the Israelite foreigners, the speckled bird, man, woman, and child, whose bloodline traces back to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all forefathers, though you may look like the heathen nations, your scattered monks, which the heathen nations, as you see on this chart, the nations starting from two on down, those are the heathen nations. Also, if your bloodline, your lineage goes back to these people, as you see right here on this chart, through the man, and if it's spirit, bear witness with this word, this truth, and you can receive it to the speckled bird, man, woman, and child, this does apply to you. You are Israelites, though you do look like the other nations due to the scattering of these people on this chart. So you will have Israelites come looking like the heathen, but they're indeed Israelites because they're under the curses of Deuteronomy 28, the 15 verse on down. They're spirit, bear witness with this word. That they are the sons and daughters of Yahweh by Shema Shai, and most importantly, their lineage goes back to these people through the man. No matter what they come looking like, if their father's an Israelite, that makes them an Israelite as well. To the few Akwaf, you few Israelite sisters that do listen, learn, and believe, Shalom to you, to the elect of the nation of Israel, wherever you may be scattered throughout the four corners of the earth, who this word is going out to, Shalom to you as well. To you so called Negroes, Latinos, Native Americans, you combine, consist, and make up the 12 tribes of Israel. You are the Hebrew Israelites. The chosen people of the Most High Yahweh and His only begotten Son, who you ignorantly call Jesus Christ, Yahweh Shah. And um, once again, just another response. Uh, you had another this dude, same dude. He put uh, Black Lives Matter as a new world order, satanic communist scam. Which that's true. It is a new uh, uh, uh you know, it is a new world order uh scam. You know, which we're not a part of Black Lives Matter. We don't condone or we don't walk with Black Lives Matter because we're not black. With different shades of brown, man. Okay? They never did care about, you know, so-called blacks. The money donated all goes support the Democrat Party and other groups. They are going, yeah, that's right. They are. You know? But it's this comment right here that stuck with me. It says, I already told you, you know, I am white. Which I'm going to get into that. There's no such thing as a so uh, white people, man. Okay? Otherwise known as Caucasian, which that's another thing I'm going to get into, and says there's absolutely no shame connected to being white. You're right, because white people don't exist, okay? This does not mean that I'm arrogant, which Esau, you know, you eat them, I saw arrogant, okay? So, I'm going to show you this right here, which I had watched up to 15 minutes of it. I didn't get to watch the rest of it, but it's very interesting, you know? And, um... I'm uh, planning on watching this whole video when I get the uh, time to do it. Because, you know, I'm at the gig right now, so I might have to chop this in two parts. But before I uh, play the video, I'm just going to start off with this scripture. You know? Because she's going to go into, you know, how, you know, uh, uh, whites, how the uh, white was created, man. You know? Psalms 64 and 8. It says, let me see, this Psalm 64 and 8, it says, So they shall make their own tongue to fall upon themselves. All that see them shall flee away. And this chapter goes into the elites, okay, on how all these people that's in their circle are going to come out, and your own people are going to come out and expose, okay, Everything about you, man. So I'm going to play it. Peace and love. Peace and love, Cosmic Family. Yes, sir. You know Ali is a brother I come with truth. Subscribe. Subscribe to the channel. Subscribe. YouTube, Facebook. Subscribe. Subscribe. Yes, I um, You know, as my, as you, Jal, we don't come for people's feelings, but sometimes the truth really hurt feelings, you know? Jal, you know, you were sad when you're in this world for years of lies and induction. The truth really hurt feelings, you know. Jano, you were sad when you're in this world for years of lies and indoctrination, but they, somehow you have to learn to handle your feelings just like that.
Jacqueline Agos Pitts. White people did not exist before 1681. Again, white people did not exist on planet Earth until 1681. Number two, any claim that this group called white people, um, any claim that that group is rooted in biology or derived um, from genes or biology or is innate or is from nature is a lie. Third and final point, as a matter of foundational law, actually let me say it this way, white supremacy has been embedded in the United States of America from its founding as a matter of law. Now, I don't expect you to buy all that, to get all that, to believe all that, at least not now. But my job is to share with you the um, legal history that proves each of those three claims that I begin with. So let's go. Let's get started. We have to begin this conversation in colonial North America, specifically in the colonies, the British colonies of Maryland and Virginia. Both were British colonies and both shared a number of particular characteristics. First, their economies were rooted in tobacco farming. If you know much about tobacco farming, it requires tremendous human labor lots and lots of workers. So those who owned large plantations, uh, big landholders, constantly needed laborers to do the work to grow the tobacco. In addition to sharing an economic base, both colonies had an incredible gender imbalance, roughly 10 men for every woman. Now, let's understand a little bit about the folks who constitute the people in these two colonies. Oh, and by the way, let me give you a, um, a year. Uh, we're in the early 1600s, okay? The early part of the 17th century, colonial North America. England had, uh, for some bizarre reason that today demographers cannot explain, there was a population boom in England in the early 17th century. So there were lots and lots of poor British people who were on the public doles, who couldn't find a way to make a living, who couldn't feed themselves. So the king in England was quite happy to have them sign a contract of indenture to then go work um, in the British colonies. And that is what happened. Both indentured and enslaved persons, according to historian Edmund Morgan, were sold and traded like cattle. But of course, not all laborers stand equal in terms of their labor agreement or lack thereof. Those who came under a term of indenture worked for a term of years, and presumably this indenture was an agreement that they chose to enter into. The terms of indenture were largely protected by British law, although the terms that took form in colonial North America were quite different than those that existed in um, England. For example, in England, indentured servants could marry because that was viewed as the way to produce the next group of workers. In this country, indentured servants were prohibited from marrying, and if women were unfortunate enough to get pregnant during their term of indenture, they added usually about seven to nine years onto their term of indenture and one year to the father. Slavery, of course, was a status that came with life, work for life. There was neither British law nor international law to prohibit or restrict slavery. What we do know is that at this time period in colonial North America, there were free persons of African descent, um, we know that landholders um, freed slaves. They did so in wills. They did so by allowing them to purchase their own freedom or the freedom of a family member. The vast majority of workers, laborers, um, in colonial North America at this time were British men, British workers, the vast majority. Um, there were some women, there were some European laborers from Portuguese, Dutch, um, folks from 
Ireland and from Scotland are also revealed in the um, records, but the vast majority were British men. There were small numbers of persons of African descent, and there were even smaller numbers of members of native tribes. Um, but in this slide, I'm trying to capture the socioeconomic ladder, and really that ladder should be about as long as this room. Uh, the landholding elite are, in today's parlance, that's the 1%. And the vast majority of folks um, who were in the colonies um, were laborers. Again, they were British, other Europeans, Africans, and members of native tribes. Here's what I find folks have the most difficult time with. We tend to really struggle with getting a good picture of social life, the social context at this juncture. We're very good at understanding the social relations that exist later, and we'll talk about those in a moment. But pre-Bacon's Rebellion society is something that we generally in this country struggle to grasp. Um, so I'm going to do my best to paint a broad stroke picture um, of this time period. What we know is that British and African laborers worked ate, and slept together. Furthermore, the evidence from this period, um, which covers the first three quarters of the 17th century, that the anecdotal evidence reveals that they lived under similar conditions and faced the same, the same opportunities and chances to make it once one was free of their term of service, whether free of enslavement or free of indenture. So let's review this. British laborers constituted the vast majority of the populations in both colonial Maryland and colonial Virginia. All men, of course, because the law of coverture, let me tell you something about that law of coverture. Um, the law of coverture is derived from British common law and it um, structures marriage. And this is how um, Barrister Blackstone dis famously described the law of coverture. In marriage, the man and the woman become one, and the one is the man. You didn't have the right to retain your own wages. You couldn't um, create estate planning, wills, or trusts without the approval of a man. So all men who were free of indenture or enslavement face the same opportunities in these colonies as a matter of law. For example, free men of African descent could own servants or slaves, and they did. They could vote, and they did. They could marry persons of the opposite sex. God, and I love that I have to make that qualification now. Woo. They could marry persons of the opposite sex regardless of national origin, and they did. In fact, marriages between men of African descent and women primarily of British descent were not uncommon at all. In one county, one half of the free men of African descent were married to a European woman. There was a challenge to these marriages, but it did not come from the masses. It came from elites. And that's what we're going to talk about next. All right, this little depiction um, is meant to be a depiction of the um, lawmakers in Maryland, colonial Maryland lawmakers. Um, they passed a law in 1664 punishing, and I quote, British and other freeborn women who marry enslaved Negro men. The punishment for entering into these marriages um, was that the woman herself would be enslaved for the, her husband's life, and any children they have would be enslaved into their 20s. And see, it's a reason they was doing that, because, see, they had common knowledge of how, uh, 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 you know, a nation works, man. These elites, they knew. So let me get that. Okay, let me actually get Psalm 64 again. You know, they knew. It's a reason why they was doing that, because they knew. This is uh, Psalms 64. Let me see. Right? It says, 
I star Psalm 64 and 2 says, Hide me from the secret counsel of the wicked, you Edomites. Start with these elites. It says, From the insurrection of the works of iniquity. Now, this is simply going to the elites. Who wet their tongue like a sword and bend their bows to shoot their arrows, even bitter words, that they may shoot in, a, in secret at the perfect suddenly do they shoot at him and fear not. Which, that could uh, apply to these laws that they have, these politicians put into place, man, to oppress, you know, Jake, you know? So-called Negro, Latino, Native American. But here's the point. They encourage themselves in the evil matter. They commune of laying snares privately. They say, who shall see them? They search out iniquities. They accomplish a diligent search. Meaning they do a lot of research. You know? They do a lot of, uh, 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 you know, digging up things. Certain things that people don't, you know, seem to want to dig up. It says, both the inward thought of every one of them and the heart is deep. See? And they knew that the man, okay... So let me get that. Your, your lineage is determined by the house of your fathers. It's going to say in this, this uh, chapter and verse. This Numbers 1 and 18 says, And they assembled all the congregation together on the first day of the second month, and they declared their pedigrees after their families by the house of their fathers according to the number of the names from 20 years old and upward by their poles, man. That's how it works. You are what your father is, man. Okay? If your mother, for instance, is a... You know, speaking of Jake, if your mother, like, is a, a, a heathen, if she's an Edomite, so-called white woman, for instance, you know, and your father's an Israelite or so-called Latino or Native, you know, so-called black, Latino, Native American, man, you are, okay, what your father is. There's no such thing as a mixed race, okay? There's no such thing as that. See, the elites did that and put that out there, you know, these DNA testing kits, you know, that people go and uh, get tested to find out what they are. They put that out there to keep you, you know, confused, man. Okay, but the reality is you are what your father is. No matter what you look like, I always open up with that. You could come out looking like a so-called Negro, but if your father's an Edomite, you're still an Edomite. It's the opposite. In the same way around, man. You will have, a, 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 you know, so-called black man, white woman come together. That child could come out looking like an Edomite. But if his father's an Israelite, then he's an Israelite as well. Okay? That's how it works. And they knew that. So that's why they had to put these laws that she's going to go into in place, okay, to stop that. See, it, was, it wasn't a big deal with the other nations. But once it came to, you know, the so-called black man, you Judites, and also, you know, the southern kingdom, I'm just going to put it that way, that's when it was a problem because they know that the sea lines of the father. Okay? So let's go back to the video. You know, this is an interesting video. I'm planning on finishing it up when I have the time to. Hmm. Now imagine that you are a plantation owner. That's not a bad deal. I get more property. I like that. And that is exactly what happened. Rather than deter these marriages, which is the express intent of the law of 1664... Um, rather than deter them, these marriages were encouraged um, by property owners because that, in fact, that such a marriage increased their property value. This law, this law of 1664, represents, if not the first, certainly the precursor to anti-miscegenation law. These are laws that punished or prohibited marriage between, notice that white people didn't exist yet in 1664, um, at least as referenced. In so they didn't, she said they didn't exist yet. So she, you, you want to see where she's getting at. You know, because when I was watching her, I said, okay, I see where she's, you know, coming up. Let me keep going. That law. But most generally speaking, anti-miscegenation law prohibited and punished marriages between a white person and a specific non-white person or persons. Let me be really clear. I read all the time in history books, in academic texts, um, and I hear, I read, anti-miscegenation law described as prohibiting interracial marriage. That's not correct. For example, a person of, a member of a native tribe could marry a person of Chinese descent. Both were understood as racially distinct. 
but never did anti-miscegenation law prohibit such kinds of marriages. The only marriages that anti-miscegenation law prohibited were those between a white person and always a person of African descent sí. and sometimes various other groups. Okay, so just so we're really clear about anti-miscegenation law and its link um, to whiteness. A couple other things to note about anti-miscegenation law. It's not derived from British law. Anytime um, we look at law and study history and you see a break from British common law, you always want to pay attention because it tells us something about the needs and desires of those who wielded power um, in the colonial context. So anti-miscegenation law was one of these laws. They're, they were passed colony by colony and then state by state. It's a really important area of law um, for a number of reasons. Um, but for our purpose this morning, it's because it's where this human category called white first appears on planet Earth the first time. In addition, anti-miscegenation law is important because it lasted more than 300 years. These anti-miscegenation laws literally shaped the faces of this group of more than 2,000 X number of people that I'm looking at today. The Maryland legislature um, sought to correct for the encouragement of marriages that they described in that previous law of 1664 as, quote, a disgrace, unquote, to the British people, as an indication that the, quote, British or freeborn woman must be forgetful of her status as free, end quote. So they passed the law of 1681, and in this law, it made it illegal for British and other white women from marrying a Negro slave. There it is. And furthermore, the law punished any landholder who encouraged the marriages and any religious authority who performed it. So. This law equals the invention of the human category white. There it is, okay? This is where it, 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 it stemmed from. It really stemmed from basically eating my woman dealing with Jake, okay? But there's more to it. So I'm going to play a little bit more, but I'm going to have to uh, do a part two on this because, you know, my time, I got something to do, but um, I'm going to keep it going. Did these group of laborers, some of whom are from Portugal, some um, from Holland, some from Ireland, Scotland... Did, did they have a little genetic transformation that occurred right after the General Assembly in Maryland met, creating a genetic sludge that we can now call white? Virginia passed its first anti-miscegenation law in 1691. In Virginia, the law prohibited both white men and white women from marrying um, African, uh, pardon me, a person of African descent or a member of a native tribe. Um, but, lest I leave you thinking that gender equality um, was being created in this law, let me quickly dispel that. Studies um, of antebellum courts reveal that, in fact, anti-miscegenation law um, was that, at least in the language of the law, prohibited these marriages for white men and white women. But here's what we know from antebellum court cases. Um, we know that plenty of white men married and or engaged in intimate sexual relations um, with prohibited women. However, very rarely were they brought to court and punished under the anti-miscegenation law. See, that's what, that's, that's, that's what they do. They're hypocrites. Okay, the law applies. See, it's, it's law and justice when it comes to you Israelites, right? They throw the book at you, but when it's them, they get away with it. You know, the law is slack, like the scriptures say, you know. Very rarely. So here, pay attention to this. This law, in its enforcement, is largely focused on increasing on controlling the relationality and the sexuality of white women 
and non-white men. Furthermore, think about um, the enforcement. I'm gonna get a scripture real quick, and I'm gonna have to to uh, close it right here in part one. But it's uh, Isaiah 32, right, and five. It says the vile person was going into Esau shall be no more called liberal, nor the churl said to be bountiful. For the vile person will speak villainy, and his heart will work iniquity to practice hypocrisy. They'll put laws in place to where it benefits them, but if it's Jake, okay, anybody else, okay, they get punished, man. And to utter error against the Lord, Yahweh Bashim Shah, to make empty the soul of the hungry, he will cause the drink of the thirsty to fail. The instruments also of the churl are evil. He devises wicked devices to destroy the poor with lying words, even when the needy speak of right. You know? And this is what he does. That's what they did, okay, with this uh, uh, law that she's speaking about. You know? Practices that come out of...